Welcome to the SDA Housing Podcast, brought to you by NDIS Property Australia. Before starting this episode, we need to provide a general disclaimer. Information contained in this podcast is general in nature only. It does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. You need to consider your financial situation and needs before making any decisions based on the information in this podcast. And you should consider seeking independent and professional advice for your personal circumstances. All right, let's begin. Hello, everybody. My name is Min, and I'm your co-host with Debbie from the SDA Housing Podcast. And we're here for our first video with Tanya Gomez, David Whitelaw, and Brendan Wolf. Welcome all. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. First of all, Tanya, thank you very much for having us here at your event. This we, we this will be our first like, group get together for from a video perspective. We have no topic or agenda today. Mm. Let's throw some curveballs in here, and uh, let's talk a bit about random stuff by SDA. Sure. David. Well, I'd, I'd like to start with that, that Brendan and I have uh, delivered a few seminars together and we've been invited by silk providers and I love working with Brendan. As I said, we, we both come at from a different point of view and, and Brendan talks about his lived experience and, and what I want to do, continue to work with Brendan because he just had so much value into this space, but his knowledge and just be able to get Brendan's knowledge, you know, to help people, Brendan's main ethos is about being able to help people and how we can do that. I know that he's come on board with NDIS Property Australia, which is exciting, got the shirt on. And, you know, just just the opportunity, Brendan, of you being able to show people your journey. And I said to you just recently, and, and, and I'd like you to reflect on it, I don't think your journey's really started. Well, one journey started, one journey's finished, the main one's about to start. And it's about how you are going to help people in this space. I'm really keen on it. Oh, yeah, Dave, I think you're right. My journey is only just hardly finished and a new journey is about to begin. And through that, I've sort of set up my own little consultancy business, um, specifically helping um, NDIS participants go through that application, the SEA application process, what's involved around the evidence gathering, um, that sort of thing, including the appeals process, what what the timeframes are likely to be, how to engage with an SDA provider, how to engage with the SIL provider, that sort of thing. Because what we know from a previous experience is an NDIS participant is likely, more likely, and probably feels more comfortable talking to someone who has actually gone through the process themselves. Yeah, yeah ab- absolutely. And, and, I, and I guess from a learning experience and what you want to get that message across, I have learned so much you know, from the journey that, that you've taken effectively or we've taken together over the last few years and, um, and how we, we need to be able to have the opportunity to take that information and to get it out to support coordinators, it is so valuable to, to understand what, what, what that process is because it is so complex. Well, interesting you talk about support coordinators because a lot of support coordinators don't fully understand the SDA process and that's where I fell sort of in the gap with my, with my level of SDA funding. My support coordinator instantly thought that, you know, I had the appropriate level of funding and it was because of you, Dave, that picked up on that and, and that's how we had to go down the process that we went down. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. I do remember having a conversation uh, at the time with with, with the support cause. So, David, Tanya, how, do you, how does the market get more educational information to the, to the SCs out there for, the, for them to learn more about this SDA field? What, what do you think? We, we, we see lots of courses. NDIS are running courses and and and, uh, and then you've got the private enterprise guys but there are some consultancy and advocacy groups out there that that do not not a lot of lived experience participants though and that's where Brandon becomes incredibly valuable but i you know probably every second or third day i see a new course pop up so there is that education out there that yeah. is coming through and i think the ndia in particular see that opportunity of, of still educating but you know just having a conversation having a 20-minute conversation with brendan you learn so yeah Tanya, in your past life as a, well, your, your working life as a, 
clients on. So do you come across many participants who are actually becoming resident providers to be SCs and, and, and whatnot? Uh, not, not necessarily just support coordinators, but I do see it's not a large proportion, but I do see that there are uh, people with lived experience who are moving into the NDRS space. From my perspective, I feel like that people in the disability space that, that work in this sector, they've all come here for, the majority have come here for one person that they have in mind. So for me, I started working as a special needs teacher because I met one little boy when he was four years old with cerebral palsy that was sat head down in the sand pit and no one wanted to help him up and he couldn't help himself up. And so my mission became, I fell in love with him. He's now 23 and I call him my godson and he's he's impacted my life, but he's the reason I chose the path that I did. And out of uh, in my previous life in Provider Plus, I registered 5,000 NGOs providers and out of the, the vast majority are doing it for one person, whether it is someone like that touched their life like mine was a child that I was caring for in a childcare centre, but it could be a, a father, a mother, a brother, a, you know, There's so many amazing stories where someone has said, right, this is now personal. This isn't about money. This isn't about glory. This isn't about yields. This is about the support of this person and that they deserve better. And so I'm going to do better for them. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think people with disability, with lived experience are so passionate and it became so personal for Brendan. And he wasn't going to let that go. And it's not until there's skin in the game that we can create change. And I think that's really where the rubber hits the road. Yeah. David, the word saturation is spoken a lot about in the SDA segment sector there. Is there ever a saturation point for providers and system here? Well, what, what do you both think? And yeah. yeah. Yeah, look, I, I, when we have a look at new sites, you know, so someone presents us with a site and, um, yeah, we do a little bit of research about what current providers there are. There are many, many providers that are trying to set up and establish in areas. So when it comes to being a silk provider, yeah, there's a lot of competition. The SDA providers, we're, we're all a little bit different and we all sort of focus on different things. But, but, but I mean, there are a lot of big players yeah, in the silk market. Yeah. I mean, you say 5,000 if you wanted to, but at what point in the future is there too many providers? Not, or not audited, registered, but 50% of all registered providers never become active. They never take a participant on, yeah. right? So it's not that big. I, I think I think that um, we're not at a saturation point yet, but it, the NGRS is a demand-driven system. It is, it's supposed to be the best person gets the work. And so I think it keeps us all innovative on our toes and working harder. Um, I was on the board of a, a disability provider for eight years before moving – I was I ran their registered training organization, but they were part of a disability uh, company. Well, they did in-home care for for children with disabilities. And you know, when I was part of that transition, Tanya, are there enough providers, still providers, and whatnot in the system? You say that there's only there's half of them are really just registered. Yeah. And, uh, and given the fact that the agency does do the audits and the, and the renewals, if there are inactive providers as well, they also lapse eventually. No, there's no provision to remove a registration because you don't have participants. When we first were audit, doing order to training, there was this idea that if you didn't use it, you would lose it, but that's never eventuated. And I don't believe there's actually um, a standard or a rule that you can stop someone. So that as long as they go through their audit cycles and do their midterm, they can continue to not have participants. But yeah, There's about 50% of people who are registered never see participants. But there's also a, a whole number of unknown number of people who are unregistered providers. So how do you even track or measure that? I don't think we're at saturation point yet. I think that um, it demand-driven system wants more people in the market to do better, to be innovative. Do so you think, though, like, given the current, like as you know, the NDIS is being reviewed as a whole currently, do you think whatever comes out of that review, there might be some changes in the way providers on on who can provide and how many providers can provide. I don't think there'll be caps on how many can provide. I hope that we will. So the NGRS Commission has a scheme where they have low risk providers called verified, higher risk called certified, and then they have specialist modules and SDA is the, the fit special module. And so I think that we've got a tiered system. It makes logical sense to me 
from my perspective that you would make anyone certified have to be registered. But I, 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 I think that is actually a legislation change, not just changing the practice standards. So I think there's a long way to go through the lower and the upper house to make those changes happen. We, we, also, we also have the independent support workers too. Like a lot of participants prefer to go down that independent support worker path. And what we currently know is there's no regulation on independent support workers. I strongly think that whatever comes out of this review, there will be some sort of regulation around independent support workers. I hope so. Um, I hope so, but I, I, I don't know how soon that would happen. And I also wonder and question how does that, you know, push into choice and control if we make it too hard for the independent support workers and we give them too much regulation, who does that force out? Does it force some good people out? And does that impact choice and control? But I think there needs to be something. I think that it that there needs to be a level of checks. I also kind of feel that um, some of my clients in Victoria, as an example, it can take nine to 12 months to get a worker screening check. So if we can't even do the basics that are in place to that are there to protect participants, and we've made this national system that is run terribly and, and state-based when it's supposed to be national and administered different and has different amounts of costs and isn't a really national system. Until we've got the basics of those frameworks, can we put more regulation in place? Can the government carry the burden of the regulation of that? I can go back to what Min originally asked though about the SDA provider market being saturated. saturated. I think based on the demand-driven system that you were talking about, Given the, the huge demand we've still got for SDA and the demand that we are expecting moving forward for SDA over the next 10 years, I think there's a, there's a lot of room. Yeah, and absolutely. The other issue, not really an issue, but in 2016, there were lots of, to kick SDA off, is that SIL providers were given SDA status mm-hmm. as well. And, um, and what we're seeing is uh, now that those SIL providers have dropped off and are working with SDA providers, and so they don't have that conflict between well, SDA yeah. and SIL. And so we, we're still seeing uh, many providers who are care providers that were just granted or gifted uh, SDA when it rolled over in 2016. Huh. Uh, eventually, we'll get to a, a very, very smaller number of SDA companies, I think, long term. Yeah. Around SIL providers in SDA, Coming from an experience that I had when I first moved into my SDA, we we had a well-known silk provider move in, but they just struggled and they couldn't quite deal with the the SDA levels that they were they were supporting. So we had to change silk providers. I think being a first-time silk provider in in an SDA model that they have never done before, I think there needs to be something around the level of experience that they've had, like a minimum of like two years, like sort of supporting in that level because participants need to feel safe and and comfortable with their providers. And when a provider is not, you know, up to par with their support, it does create that Angst feeling amongst participants. Brenda, I think you've created, you, you stated a really good point is that there are some SIL providers who can develop a roster of care based around an apartment complex. There are SIL providers who can create a roster of care around houses as well. But having a really good, deep understanding of how it works, I think, is really important. And, and once you get that right, then you can create that security and safety around the development complex, and no, I think you're spot on. From my perspective, what I would like to see for a SIL provider, and I'm, yeah, what I'd like to see but without committing to say that I'm doing anything, what, what I see is a solution there is I, I work with 30 to 50 SIL providers at the moment. I manage, they outsource their compliance to me for 12 months at a time. Um, and I'm really heavily involved in all things audit, all things even operations, helping them take on a new participant, understanding the risks from a governance or, you know, compliance framework. But what I would like to see for them is I think they have really great intentions, 
I, I think that there isn't a lot of support around what does a good SIL model look like. And I would really like to see a framework developed, not by government, I think it's industry, need to come up with a standard. And I think it needs to be flexible. And I think there's lots of room for individualization, but a framework. Like I went to this Bali retreat and, and, and with 35 providers and, and spoke about um, quality and compliance. There was a speaker on finance. And it was mind boggling to me that the providers in the room, some of them very large with lots of participants, didn't know how to run a P&L, didn't know how to manage their cash flow. They might have been making six, seven million dollars in turnover and then making money, but they, they had no idea about their cost base. They, they're not educated on the basics of business. So I'd like to see a framework which might include something like mentoring with, with established SIL providers, less experienced because there is enough market and we need to have a certain standard, but I think it needs to be self-regulated I think if we wait for the agency to come up with it or the commission to come up with it, it's not going to be fit for purpose and it's going to miss the practical the practical realities of, of running a sealed property, which is 24-7, never, never, never stopping, needs to be high quality staff, has to deal with, you know, uh, funds where you exhaust your funds and you don't get paid for months and all of the challenges that maybe these first time business people are cha- uh, uh, experience. I would also like to see a creation of a new model where participants who live in that complex get to prov- get to choose their own provider through whether it be independent support workers. Say you have ten participants living in an apartment complex, and each of them have like eight or nine different support workers, and how they all all those support workers can support everyone at one time that would be that would be an innovative effective way and that would show then participants using their choice and control on how their supports are delivered well we're seeing a couple of changes heading towards that one is flexible funding supports um the introduction of ILO was another option as well but you know and it goes from SIL ILO flexible funding but and then independent, but you've also got in kind supports as well. Might be from a partner. There are so many different ways that that a participant can um, look at that funding level, and and having the flexibility is really important. Well, Tanya, earlier off uh, off off screen, um, we talked about your your first experience in the Perth SD conference event. Um, I would love to ask you directly, how does it feel coming from your side being auditing compliance? into the SDA world, your first impressions, uh, good and bad. Yeah. How do you feel about the difference between the two sides, being the civil side and the SDA side? Yeah, look, it's it's the different side of the same coin. Um, and, look, I'm really enjoying the learning experience and learning more about how it actually works. I've audited many SDA providers and I'm coded to, to audit, so only certain people can audit SDA providers, and I'm I'm able to do that. I, I can only not do module one, which is for registered nurses. I'm coded for everything else, and I I've I've audited many SDA providers, but I never truly understood that they're, they're property managers, as you know, essentially, and I've never really understood how that works. It is a whole new world, and so I'm learning the acronyms, and I'm interested to learn how it all works. I think the differences from my perspective coming from being an early childhood teacher who is about the outcome, not the income. And I've made money in my life, but it's never been chasing money. It's been chasing outcomes for whatever problem I'm trying to solve. I, I feel like there's there in the room that was in, there was a lot of focus on money. And I wasn't overly enthused by how participants were. It was, and you know, it's it's so great hearing David speak about. And uh, speak about with Brendan with such high regard, but I kind of felt like participants were missing from the story, talking about them as tenants and talking about them as yields and numbers. I'm used to talking about them as the supports and the needs, and are we meeting the needs? And I feel like I feel like that piece was missing. There was a few people who spoke of it really well, but I thought most of it was focused on. In my head, I was like, "There's a piece missing in this room." I, oh, I get that sense too when you're talking to someone at the NDIA. You're just a number plate and a value of money. Yeah. And at the end of the day, when we're not just a bucket of funding and a number, 
we are human beings first and foremost. And we we've got we're living with disabilities that we never asked for in the first place. We're just trying to live our lives the best way that we possibly can. And the one word that a lot of people use that the disability community does not like, and that's inspirational. We are not inspirational. We are just living our lives the best way that we can with what we're dealt. And it's a really, sorry, sorry, I mean, it's a really fine line between clinical and commercial mm-hmm. and they to a, to a forever hungry. But what we want to be able to do is create a, a model that is commercial because the more commercial, the better the product is going to be. Mm-hmm. But then for Brendan to take what exists to make it very homely and mm-hmm. make it work um, for your own specific needs. And that's what I love. And I think that that's important is that, you know, we, we, we sort of, you know, are on two sides. Yes, we've got to be commercial. That's what SDA was was originally developed for, is it a private enterprise to, to, to come up with something that is commercial. But then it's about taking that commercial opportunity and making it very homely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Debbie, you and I have been on this journey for three years now, and it's unfortunate that, you know, the SDA world sees the still world, the other world, as a commodity because that's what they see it, the, the currency and the, the percentage of that commodity to get what they want, which is the yield and the revenue. But the, in their defence, not that I'm defending them, without that inflow of money, to, of capital to build the products, there is no future product. uh, products or, yeah. or forever homes. So we, we understand both sides. Mm. We try to do our best to understand both sides. Of yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's difficult because they only see numbers. Yeah. Um, when you, you, you listen to Brendan and you take advice from Brendan, you know, he, he's obviously in, in the team now. But mm. um, you also talk to silk providers. It, it is gathering as much knowledge as we can to, to get the, the model right. But again, silk providers, they all, they're all very different. SDA <laughs> providers are different. Silk providers are very different. But under choice and control, you know, Brendan's made a choice and, and that's what he wants and that's what he went for. It took a long time. So, successful. No, I think also it, it's, it's, it's just part of the framework as far as, you know, I think that we only do things that are measured or that you're going to get a carrot or a stick about, right, it, a, a, as a commercial business. So in the standards for a cell provider, there is a standard that requires that they have, they have, they have, the standard is something like provide opportunities to people with disability to give feedback on their policies, procedures, and governance. That standard or that 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 quality indicator isn't in the SDA standards. It's not required of an SDA provider to do that. By best practice, you would do that. You would do that for choosing locations. You'd go participant-led, um, but it's not a requirement of the standard, so there's no stick. If I go to a SIL provider and they haven't been doing it, I can give you a non-conformance and I can say I'm coming back in 90 days to see that you've done this. I'd, with an SDA provider, I go, so you've done no consultation? No. And you've just built 10 houses robust all in a row? Yes. There's no way for me to give you a cross. Oh. <laughs> you know? So I think I think it's, it's always by design that SDA is a separate sector within NDIS. Separate. Debbie, when you were at the Perth event and did your two presentations, which which Dana obviously saw, the second presentation about short-term accommodation, the cousins of SDA being mm. ILO, STA, MTA, SIL, around the word SDA, how did that go with the crowd and the after effects of that exposure? Yeah, it was really interesting that... And when I when I started that presentation, I, you know, I said, okay, who knows what MTA is? Who knows what STA is? MTA was better known. And I guess because it is so closely aligned with SDA, but there seemed to be a lot more hesitancy about what STA actually was. And, and what does that mean? Short term accommodation. So that did start a conversation. I, I obviously I gave my presentation, but at the end of the day, when we had a panel and there was a lot more discussions came out, and even just in future d- discussions later that evening, there was a lot of talk, a lot of talk about STA and respite and how it worked and how people could be involved in it. Why do you think the interest is there now on this topic, from this, from this event? I think maybe they'd heard about it. They really weren't sure what it was. Uh, they were still learning. They didn't realise what kind of money was there. Keywords. So there we go again, money. <laughs> when they saw those figures, it was like, wow. It's very interesting how we're talking about STA at the moment. 
because I'm seeing through social media a lot of these STA providers saying, oh, you know, short-term holiday, come, you know, come to us and go to the theme parks. But yet you go to the NDIA and you say you want to go on a holiday. They don't like that work. No. They do not like that work. So you can providers advertising a false, <laughs> you know, product and you've got participants being let down mm. because you can apply for holiday. You can go on a holiday, but yet the NDIA don't allow that. Mm. How do how do we how do we overcome that? Well, Demi, what's the foundational understanding of what respite? Respite is firstly a chance for the the informal carers to have a break from their day to day twenty four seven caring of their loved one. Uh, it is also a chance for the participant to have a break from their daily routine to try new things have new experiences, develop skills. So that's where that kind of holiday thing comes in. And no, we don't term it as a holiday, but it can be a break from their normal routine, go somewhere different, stay somewhere new. That is capacity building. I wanted to mention on your point about STA and MTA, that post your talk, and not just people who are in the room, but it seems maybe it maybe it went through the, the grapevine is that my phone has been nonstop ever since about I want to set up STA. Even people not in NGIS, I had I went on a retreat myself in March, and the people who ran that retreat out of nowhere called me and was like, "I'm going to set up short term accommodation and retreats for people with disability. Can you help me with this, this, and this, and explain this, this, and this?" And I was like, "What is happening?" It's like Phil is the other one. My phone rings hot about I'm I'm a at a church, a church group called me last week and said, I want to, I want to do 15 sill houses. And I was like, okay, so what do you know about sill? No, nothing. Okay. And they kept saying, oh, we've got the manpower. I was like, what manpower do you have? Thinking support workers. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, we, we feed the homeless, but we want 15 sill houses. Can you make that happen? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think there is, a, in terms of sill, and a lot of, I've seen a lot of people, you know, there's still a lot of, bad press about SIL saying that it is a cash cow. And that realistically, that's why people are wanting to do SIL because there is a lot of money in SIL. Question, is that correct? Is SIL a cash cow? Oh, I don't think it is. We've seen lots of providers. Well, it has been. It has been uh, in the past. And, and I did read an article once that said that SIL was a 38% profit margin. And, and that article also stated that SIL went into a 2% profit margin. Oh. The system changed. You know, you you, you would put in all, all the the hours that's required to support someone, and you'd press a button, and it would come out with a monetary figure. Now you're given a monetary figure, and just say, "Hey, make it work." So, you know, we, we've seen a reduction in sill over the past. But I, I think there's still pockets where it's quite yeah. really pretty, like yeah, a six yeah, on yeah. one care or what you know, yeah, yeah. complex complex care. I think that the niche niche shows that exists, there's still pockets where it's quite lucrative. A lot of providers can make it work. Yeah. yeah. A lot of providers can make it work, absolutely. But if you take the disability support worker model, which tells you what you should be paying people and they, they break out your percentages, if you work just off that, there isn't a large profit no. margin to be had. No. Well, in the SDA space, is that only 6% of participants in the NDIS will get SDA? You know, is there something to support the other 94% of participants? Mm-hmm. No, not at the moment. Is that where ILO is coming in? And not when it comes to ours. I, I think this is where what we heard earlier in the years, the minister come out and say the states have, a, a, like the NDIS is not a light and hope. And when it comes to participants who aren't on the NDIS, who don't have SDA, the states have a responsibility to those people to provide adequate, safe housing. The states have a responsibility to step up here. Yes, they've, they've signed up to the agreement and they're, they're willing to pay whatever, but they still have a responsibility to provide services outside of the NDIS. I agree. Yeah. More social, community, portable housing. Uh, and and, uh, and I think that SIL uh, and ILO will see the benefits. Yes. I think that wraps up our session then. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please make sure you are subscribed and following us so you can keep in the loop with all of our upcoming episodes. We would really appreciate it if you could leave us a five-star rating, a written review, and to share this podcast with those that could benefit. Until next time, catch you on the next episode.